Okay, very good morning. It is Wednesday, 13th of January. As you can see, I'm joined by none other than Sam North. Hi, guys. He's, he's, uh, he's been building up his beard for his return <laughs> to the morning briefing. But I um, thought I'd get Sam on because we've got a new group on our professional trader program at the moment. And what I wanted to do was bring Sam on because, as you see, I delivered the briefing generally on the macro fundamental basis every morning. Um, but I wanted to really connect the two in how is it that what I talk about then gets implemented in terms of a trading strategy. And obviously, Sam uh, is a trader. He trades every day. So I'm an analyst. So it's good to, I think, connect the dots and see how, from a macro point of view, we can turn that into a, an actionable trading strategy. And, and, and Sam's going to be on. He can talk through the charts from a little bit more of a, a technical perspective. Uh, and hopefully we can tie in the news as well. So uh, first things first, let's just have a quick look at the charts and how things are looking this morning. So the overall general sentiment was we had a fairly flat close on Wall Street, actually. I mean, it was one of the more quiet days, I'd say, for US indices compared to what we have been accustomed to uh, in recent weeks. So pretty flat across the three majors. Uh, I think, as I've said a couple of times uh, in Amplify Live, uh, stream this week. I think this week specifically is quite uh, backloaded. The second half of the week really commencing today with US CPI this afternoon. And um, we've got Biden's stimulus plan coming up. We've got jobless retail sales. There's a number of things as well as US earnings as well with the big banks on Friday coming up that I think just lends its hand then given the run up and general move we've had across asset classes since the blue wave almost surprised to some extent that was confirmed last week, a little bit of a hiatus in price movement, just awaiting then some of these other bigger um, fundamental events to unfold. So interesting things to, to have a look at then, and perhaps then for Sam to talk us through on some of the charts is um, in the FX space. So we've had uh, a pretty decent bounce in the dollar, of course, um, in the last couple of sessions, but that did start to peter out a little bit yesterday and that did help underline support for some of the major pairs particularly a little bit our performance in uh, cable um, one thing I was talking about in the briefing yesterday that perhaps might explain some of that partially is the fact that the vaccination program uh, has been speeding up in the UK we were early adopters of authorizing and then uh, rolling out the, the vaccine in terms of Pfizer and AstraZeneca so a um, little bit of our performance in the pound, and I've seen this morning, it's at some quite interesting levels. So perhaps we could start there and have a look at some of the dollar pairs, Sam. Yeah, no, absolutely. Let me just uh, share my screen and bring bring on the pound. And uh, as, as you mentioned, the, the dollar pairs did hit some key support yesterday and maybe the evening before. And the pound, which we'll talk through first, uh, you can see uh, just coming up on my screen uh, in a moment. This... Uh, it's had a really nice trend channel or trend line, we'll just call it for now, where you can see clearly respected going back to the high that we had on the sort of first real trading day of the year, the 4th of, of Jan there, and was held really nicely all through yesterday's session as well until we pop through. And as is the case with, with some of these breaks, you know, they really do push on and it doesn't matter if it seems overbought or whatever. And uh, yeah, took out the the high here and you know as we look then this was the next sort of key level and we didn't quite close the the day above the high that we had on the sixth which was also the low that we had on the fourth but whatever we do to then and i guess then we look at it on the week will we'll be pretty key so for the pound at the moment pretty good i would say it wouldn't be too surprising for us to have a bit of a, a retracement back down towards this area but some of those support points that you were talking about um and we were, we were saying this in the, in the Sort of the, the closing uh, end of day calls for the pound, it would have been so key if cable could have closed below 134.55 on the futures, but it couldn't. And then it reversed. And you know, then next thing you know, you're breaking above the previous support term resistance. The sellers would be super happy to see it come up to that point, but then go lower. It doesn't. We push on. And next thing you know, as we said, 137 comes in and it's almost at the high of the year. So the levels are respected well. Uh, the euro, just going to bring that on. And as you mentioned, that had a, a decent move yesterday. Same again, couldn't break lower. And what a level of support. I mean, this is just fantastic. And a couple of the, the guys, uh, the back traders, I know, I think it's Gavin got one of these trades up from 
those lows or, or it might have been in the pound but either way fantastic and you can see again it's that got that solid resistance when we look at these lows that goes and it doesn't hold back and that's just people that are short they don't want to be in this anymore um and also for the for you i'm really really interested to see where we finish the week here uh, i mean we're still down on the week but i tell you what a close above the uh sort of the breakdown area that we had back in april 2018 the first close above that 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 whole point it's going to be super super key we're in a bit of a mini range you'd call it bigger move to come if we can either break above break down below uh although ultimately that whole 120 area i actually do quite like the the look of uh along so yeah decision time to come and I, I think you can absolutely understand why uh price couldn't further break down yesterday but yeah it looks good uh certainly for, for the euro and pound although hitting resistance this this, uh, this early morning. Yeah, I mean, one thing to, to be aware of for today is from an economic calendar point of view, from a data perspective, it's pretty much non-existent as far as UK Europe is concerned. But uh, Christine Lagarde, the ECB president, is speaking at nine o'clock and she's taking part in a Q&A open session at a Reuters event. Now, she did speak earlier uh, on Monday in the week, but she didn't really say anything. It was a very off-topic kind of... Um, appearance that she was she was hosting so this certainly brings about a prospect that definitely she could say something in terms of what she could say I guess it's the usual things if you think about when the last ECB meeting was a few weeks ago you know what's changed well a blue wave for one there's been a notable market movement and that will lead us on to talking about the Fed and some of their rhetoric we've had in the last 24 hours has been particularly interesting. So anything about the blue wave, repercussions that might have for US global economy, does that alter the, the kind of policy view at all for the ECB? Vaccination rollout, we were talking about this at the beginning of the week, Europe's been very slow to really adopt, particularly the Astra drug, which really is much more wide kind of scale in terms of its manufacturing distribution capabilities. And I think it was France's um, administering doses at uh, well, the UK is doing it 15 times faster than France at the moment. So there's a couple of things here which we could be quite interesting if there is a Q&A format with the press in attendance then to question her on these sorts of things. So I definitely would be aware of that if you're trading the euro from a, from a fundamental perspective. But yeah, flipping it over to the Fed and talking about the US, um, there was actually a really nice move in US tenure last night and it came at around six o'clock so i'll bring my chart up for a moment uh, bottom right chart here you can see the timing was around six o'clock so the the timing of when government bond auctions come out um, we've had bond auctions and we have more coming through the u.s treasury throughout this week but it was the 10 year and so the kind of equal maturity bond tends to react quite aggressively uh, when it's being auctioned off or offered uh, and it was received with uh, high demand. The bid to cover ratio was, was pretty high, all things considered, given the massive amount of additional supply that's coming onto the market, still plenty of appetite to purchase this. And so markets took that as a bit of a catalyst. We bounced back up higher uh, and also putting into context the fact that the 10 years has been absolutely hammered since the blue wave and this whole kind of um, inflation expectation changed the reflation trade on stimulus and Biden and so on. So. A little bit of a reprieve there from from the lows um, but one of the things that that's emerged here is a day ago we had two new voting members on the fmc um barkin and bostic and they were talking about this idea that given the rollout of the vaccine if done successfully then we could be seeing a, a solid recovery in the us economy by the second half of this year and if that does happen that might bring about this idea then of um, talking and discussing of tapering. Now, tapering, for those who were trading back in 2013, this will ring alarm bells because that was the period of the taper tantrum. Uh, if you go back and look at history and have a look at that episode, it was basically when, I think it was when Janet Yellen was first coming in and it was this idea of it's the first very incremental approach towards reducing then the looseness or the cognitiveness of monetary policy. So you stop actively buying bonds, you stop tapering it down as a, as a tool um, in that respect. Um, I would say that, that's, that earlier fueled some of the kind of Biden blue wave trade, 
because if anything, then that's a tightening of policy. Um, however, just to rebalance the force almost, yesterday and last night particularly was littered with Fed speakers. Um, two of them that, that were standouts. Bullard, I don't think is too much of a surprise. He's a big dove. So him talking about, look, it's way too early to be talking about that kind of thing. Uh, the future is not assured just yet, not particularly with the pandemic still raging on in America. But Rosengren, who typically is a leaning hawk, um, he said that basically um, we shouldn't even be talking about tapering on purchases of government and mortgage-backed securities just, just yet. Don't expect that to be a conversation uh, at this point in time. So uh, that definitely helped that T-note bounce. Uh, and also would have assisted some of that dollar weakness yesterday because I think people were getting a little bit apprehensive about just the word tapering being brought to the table. So the Fed were pretty quick to send out the troops to kind of counteract that, to alleviate any concerns that that's you know, still, still far from, from being a reality. For my opinion, uh, I think it's way too early to be talking about tapering. Um, I, I was looking at some of the numbers uh, the number of people being uh, receiving the vaccine in the US at the moment is still kind of gradually ramping up. It's still very low uh, and definitely off initial uh, Trump targets that he set out a few months ago, which I don't think is that surprising right now. It's pretty much priced in. But there's just so many uncertainties around A, the development of the virus, and B, the success or not of the speed of the implementation of the vaccine program. I think you can't really be making assumptions just yet, not quite out of the woods um, as to then the second half of the year. So yeah, that's my kind of take on that. And that was really the major news for me to, to talk about. Um, other things, uh, Trump, uh, there was a non-binding resolution last night where the House basically were forcing Pence kind of like, look, you've got to trigger the, um, the 25th Amendment and get rid of Trump. Pence is not going to do that. He, he's already said he's not going to do that. It's this, this is all about making a political point now. It's all about the optics for the Democrats in the House, which they have more control to just really for, push home the point um, that Trump, you know, you're leaving. Here you go. Here's a departing kind of blow. We're going to have the impeachment vote today. That's probably going to go through the House and it will get rejected in the Senate. End of Trump goes. See you later. So it's not really that big a deal for markets and I'm not really going to comment on it any more than that. But um, moving on then, perhaps um, we could have a quick talk about oil, Sam, if you want to bring that chart up, because yeah, we had the API inventories last night. Uh, so to get you up to speed, we have a, a slightly surprise, not a massive, but a sizable drawdown of 5.821 million. Uh, expectations were for a drawdown just shy of 2 million. Uh, Cushing was a draw of 232,000, but we did have bills in gasoline at one point, just shy of 1.9 million, distillers 4.4 million. Um, so what was the timing at half nine on the, the price? Yeah, so we had the API a little bit of a bump higher uh, and around that 53.19 was a relative area of, of resistance that was restricting some of the price action you see on Sam's chart there uh, from yesterday. So the APIs did help act as a bit of a catalyst to, to what you just saw there on his chart has been a pretty solid rally really ever since the Saudis came out and surprised the market taking, uh, taking that decision to cut supply. Uh, that's really kind of initiated the next move and uh, with some long-term technical levels being breached, uh, we still remain fairly bullish at the moment. Uh, a lot of this obviously down to uh, the vaccination program going as per plan and also I'd be particularly interested to see the kind of details that Biden unveils when he does talk about his stimulus plans later on this week. Uh, that would be quite key then to see what exactly are we dealing with in terms of the size of potential boost or its likelihood of passing Congress. Um, but Sam, from a technical point of view, uh, any thoughts here? Yeah, I mean, what, what a move. I mean, what's that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, you know, 10 if this week is positive 10 out of 11 weeks to the upside um I you know what I, when we first came to this region 49 39 you know I would have definitely have looked to have scaled out and you can see that's what the market did really it did come down it spent a couple of weeks below it smashed through it last week 
uh, and a great finish. And it, and it looked for, for all money that it was going to hit the, the next sort of resistance point relatively quickly. Little stall uh, in the first, well, first sort of part of this week, but we continued up. So 54 55 looked super important, good resistance back on uh, yeah, the 18th of Feb, so almost. Um, almost 365 days ago, although it did go pretty sour from, from then, as uh, I'm sure we can all imagine. So, yeah, for me, that would be the, the next point to look at. Would that be a place where I would you know come out of all that trade? No. I think 57.28 is a bit more important, reason being that was just that support point that gave way uh, really from, you know, did, well, li literally a year ago, the 21st of January week, and, and then we really did push on, obviously, some very key support here then broke later we've just got above that as a resistance so yeah 57 28 will, will be not an ultimate target because i think there's still legs for it to go but a point where i could really understand there being a bit of a breather so for me if i was multiple contract long multiple lots long then i'd be looking for the price to, to come to to this point you know i'm not too interested in sort of looking at you know elliott wave or, or lunar cycles or anything like that i prefer to look at these key market levels that have been respected before last time we broke through this we really pushed lower continued down yes there was a fundamental reason for that but what a place to take some key profit so i reckon 57 28 nice line in the sand i mean from a psychological point of view a we'll close the week above that then the week after that i think we can continue on and on and 60 dollars comes quick but yeah 57 28 uh, not the next level, because that would be the the, uh, the point here, 54.46, but that would be my short-term big target. Cool, and I just wanted to share this for a moment, which is very recognisable if you're an oil trader. Um, this is looking at the Persian Gulf. And the reason why I just wanted to briefly bring this up is some headlines this morning that Iran have conducted missile naval exercises in the Gulf of Oman. Uh, so just wanted to talk about that just briefly. Uh, so here's the Gulf of Oman, obviously the northern tip of that area and the southern border then of Iran is the major global choke point um, in the world, which is the Strait of Hormuz, uh, which obviously is particularly crucial for the transportation maritime routes coming out of the Persian Gulf and the likes of Saudi, Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, and so on. So very, very sensitive area. Uh, but oil hasn't really moved and absolutely that's what I would expect. So there's a couple of things in how I'd interpret that type of news flow, which is why is Iran doing and making these kind of uh, noises at the moment? Well, for me, it's quite simple. We've got a new administration coming in. So it's time to start kind of re-scaping like the, the landscape, if you like, of what is it exactly that Team Biden's going to do in the Middle East and with the Iranian nuclear accord and, and so on and so forth. So they're just, you know, this is all, it's almost like a Brexit posturing just in a slightly more sensational way, talking of conducting missile tests and so on, but it's the same negotiation point. It's just making uh, a stance in order before then uh, you deal with the new what will be political force, which will be the, the, the Biden administration. So for me, I don't really see this um, at this point um, turning into anything more than just rhetoric. However, obviously, this is a highly sensitive area um, geographically for oil prices. And if there were, if we move back into, think about this time last year, Sam, remember it was, uh, I remember the Daily Mail putting out a headline of we're heading into World War Three. Yeah, uh, that, that was when obviously the uh, Iranian revolutionary commander got got killed, and then there was the, the prelude to that was lots of you know kind of drones being shut down on disputed territory in that particular area, and cargo ships getting captured. And yeah, we're not quite at that level uh, right now. However, um, it's definitely worth just bearing in mind and keeping an eye on. Uh, and certainly, any disruptions here would obviously be a strong positive force to to push oil up through some of these technical levels, but uh, I wouldn't anticipate that being uh, this situation any more than just rhetoric at this point in time. Um, a quick look then, Sam, at, at perhaps some of the US indices. I know it was quite a quiet day yesterday, but we've got CPI coming out later on this afternoon. Inflation um, is 
like to move higher on gasoline prices. Obviously, you've just looked at oil, it's had a phenomenal ride of late. Uh, but outside of that, price pressures, the perception is they're still pretty benign. I don't think it's the point of people getting spooked just yet about inflation. Remember this whole inflation trade that people have been looking at in the blue wave, we're talking about future inflation. Not that it's emerging right now, because remember in the US specifically, we're in the midst of um, stricter, increasingly so lockdown measures at this point in time, which is going to impede demand, generally speaking. So um, yeah, US indices though, Sam, any, any S&P yeah. and so let me, on? Let me bring on the S&P now. Um, one of, one of my favorite trades really from, from the back end of last year across multi-asset has been the false break of, of a level. And especially when you've had a nice, you know, not necessarily nice because admittedly in recent weeks, it hasn't been one direction completely, but it has still been an uptrend and it has been for a while. But the, the sort of the false break, when it looks like on the intraday that it could break down and it just can't quite, you get these, false sort of pushes lower and then you get the reversal um and it's been a really good opportunity like i said across multi-assets we saw it in the euro and the pound uh earlier in the briefing we've just seen it now with the the s p as well so that's an area to certainly keep an eye on if i was you know long medium term shorter term um you know this is the, the level for me where i would start to just panic a touch if we come lower 37.74 Really nice support in recent time, but also the high that we had back on the, the 4th of Jan. So it was uh, you know, another key level. So that, for me, marks uh, an important point to the downside. If we look to the upside, where well, you've got a pretty key resistance, and you're going to have to call it a zone. You know, today's high, if it breaks above that, you've got to be careful because yesterday's high is just above that. Then you've got the R1. Then you've got the high that we had back on the 11th. So it's, it's a zone uh, and a key one at that because you've almost got three reasons or four if you include today's high. So a bit of a, a mini range now. What happens uh, when we get up to there will be, will be interesting. A break above, then we look at new all-time high territory. Uh, if we do find resistance and come back down, midpoint, albeit choppy, you would have to sort of give it towards the pivot as another key level. So these would be the three points that I would look at today. Um, whether they even come in to get tested, of course, we don't know right now, but that's how I would see it. Uh, on the, the longer time frame, and I was uh, looking at, at this with a, a few of the guys yesterday, just about you know using Fibonacci. I'm not a massive fan of it, but on longer time frames, I will consider it. And I was just looking at sort of this recent push that we've, we've had to the upside, and depending whether you take it from the 30th of October low or the 24th, again up to you and that's maybe the issue with Fibonacci is that not everyone will have it on the same point but this whole region here the 38.2 3600 that would be a lovely pullback to, to get in but like you said is there a worry at the moment are people panicking not just yet about stocks and for us to get down there would be a six percent move I don't know about you but I can't quite see that happening just yet so for now I'll be looking at other highs and, and 37, 33, or as we said, you know, even maybe another little false break of 37, 74 could be uh, worthwhile thinking about. Quick look over NASDAQ if it's okay with you uh, as well, the Dow before um, looking at the, the longer time frames. You can see that yesterday as well came down to a sort of a lovely area of support and it's that false break. I really like this across the board. I think the Dow Jones uh, did the same, albeit on its sort of previous overnight low of the day. Look at these false breaks here. Price comes through, can't close, comes up, hits it as support, and yeah, off to the races. But importantly today, can't quite get above this all-important resistance level. So stuck in a range. Um, and yeah, I mean, the more times we come down and test those supports, you know, do you want to get long? But I think overall for now, we can continue higher, I would say. And how do you... How do you see the short term? Yeah, but it's, it's interesting because there's, you know, we were looking at the T-note move from yesterday and there was obviously a, a decent pop on the upside. But equities haven't blinked this whole talk about tapering. Obviously, from a fixed income perspective, it's a little bit more direct um, in regard to probably yield sensitivity, but stocks, <laughs> stocks not bothered by any of that chatter. And I think that's quite telling. You've also had number of people come out and criticize big tech and obviously 
none other than Donald is is spearheading that, talking about they're controlling society and we should, um, you know, take away their powers. But the one thing that this probably will lead to, this situation that did happen, whoever's fault it was on Capitol Hill, is that, you know, the Democrats will be doing just the same. They will want to relook at the types of regulations over big tech. And we know that big tech is such a proportionate, you know, large representation of what really is the stock market these days. So uh, even with that, the market's still not coming off. So um, yeah, I, it's hard to see this market coming down. I mean, you were just looking at some levels there, but you're looking at pullbacks down to what, 3,600? Yeah, 6%. I mean, hard to see that happening, a 6% move. I just can't. Can't even can't even see it. What could cause it? If I'm talk, if I'm thinking about, let's say this week alone, for example, mm. probably the one thing, you know, I don't think this would happen. But what if Biden came out and it's an absolute damp squib and it's just his proposal is just flat as a pancake and it's like it's not stimulus at all. Yeah, and it's just. Do you think like, there's any risk that Biden could, you know, come in and uh, do a lockdown, like a full scale one? No way. No that's absolute baloney he put that out as a political ploy just to be contradictory to what trump was saying yeah, no absolutely have no belief at all <laughs> not only could he not do that administering a nationwide lockdown when the u.s operates on a federal and state level is impossible yeah that's just all political gamesmanship yeah. so no but yeah would that impact markets absolutely it would would he do that? No. Could he do that? It'd be incredibly difficult. So, yeah, I don't buy into that at all. But yeah, uh, a risk perhaps. I still think the the main risk here is still the virus, and the main risk on the virus then would be we're getting lots of reports about not just the spread of the UK variant, but perhaps now a newly formed US type variant, a mutation of your mutation. Now, if that then renders vaccines redundant, we get pushed back a couple of months, which is going to impede the timings of the recovery, then I think we get a pullback. But then the Fed come in again and start talking it up. So, But that could create your 6% pullback in the interim period. Must stress, though, that that's not the base of case of what I see happening yeah. at the moment. Uh, mm -hmm. But that would be probably the one single biggest risk to the equity space uh, but yeah low probability cool all right well look and that's uh, i'm gonna end um this this briefing now but we're gonna take a few questions for the the guys in the amplify live community all right thanks sam nice one thanks